Trump's lawmakers at the White House amid criticism over his summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin. And now the president is pushing back. You're watching Outnumbered. I'm Harris Faulkner here today, Fox Business Network's Degan McDowell, also from FBN, <laughs> host of the Intelligence Report, Trish Regan, Republican strategist and senior fellow for the independent women's voice, Lisa Booth, and in the center seat today, Outnumbered, Josh Holmes, Republican political strategist and former chief of staff to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Wonder what your boss is doing today. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you. Enjoying himself as always, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. <laughs> Good to have you. Uh, let's get to the news. You bet. Okay. New reaction to President Trump's summit with, President Russian, Trump's leader summit Vladimir with Putin. Russian leader yesterday Vladimir in Helsinki, Finland. Yesterday in Helsinki, Lawmakers Finland. on both sides of the Lawmakers political aisle accusing, accusing the political President Trump of taking the side of the Russian Trump president, 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 president over election, president, election over meddling. Watch. Election meddling. Watch. I just felt like the, the, I president's, felt like comments, the, the president's comments made us look as a nation. Made us look as a nation more like a pushover. More Why like a pushover. Why you cast world, aside your friends? Would you cast aside your, allies, your friends and believe your allies and not and believe, even question and not even question uh, your main adversary. Uh, your main it's adversary. Just, it's bad. It's just what Mr. Trump did yesterday. What Mr. Trump was did yesterday was the women to betray of the, the women, the CIA, of the FBI, the CIA, and, the CIA and, and to betray the American and public. And to betray and the American public. That's why I use the term. That's why I use the term. This is nothing the short of treason. The leader of the free world should be the leader of the free world. Purports to draw a moral equivalence. Purports to draw a moral between the U.S. intelligence community between the U.S. intelligence community who is a murderous thug, who is a murderous thug. I'll talk to you later on. Right now, so I'll talk to you later on. Oh, it's been an interesting morning oh, already. It's been an interesting <laughs> morning already. It's been a short time ago. Chuck Schumer outlined four things. Chuck Schumer outlined he says four Congress things. must do he says following Congress the summit, must including do following the summit, strengthening including including sanctions against strengthening Russia, sanctions against demanding against the president's national demanding security, the president's team, national national security about team testify about what the two leaders about said behind the closed doors, doors said behind ending closed doors, attacks on the DOJ, ending attacks FBI, on the DOJ and the special FBI, counsel, and the special counsel, and insisting over the twelve Russian indicted for election interference. Words are not words enough. are not enough. Our response to the debasement of American the debasement interests interest of American interest before a foreign adversary before demands a, a response, demands not, just a response in word, not just in word, but in deed. Our country indeed. needs to see. Our country needs to see. Republicans in the Senate and Republicans the Republicans in the party, Senate and the Republican up Party show stand up and show through that action. Unlike our president, that unlike our they president, will not tolerate Russian they will not tolerate Russian aggression, aggression or accept Putin's lies or accept Putin's lies. Our Republican colleagues are not just go tisk 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 tisk. But Republican Congressman but Mark Meadows and GOP Senator Rand Paul say President Trump handled the situation appropriately, considering the circumstances. Considering the circumstances. It was a bold move to be willing to meet with, to be willing to meet with, no one's taken, no one's taken, election interference, election interference, I'm better in the day, I'm better in the day, to make sure that, to make sure that, we put this, this investigation behind us, and be on, and the offense in terms of trying to make sure that our election process is protected, I think we need to take a step back and ask ourselves, is it good to have conversation with your adversary, is it good to have conversation with your adversary, is it good to have open lines of communication with Russia. I think uh, open lines of communication is very important for avoiding war. And I think that's what I would see this uh, meeting as. Meeting as. And, President Trump and President Trump himself defending his performance himself defending at yesterday's, his performance summit, yesterday's, summit, yesterday's, summit, yesterday's, yesterday's summit on Hannity. I thought it was a really amazing time. Really about that. amazing time. I think not it's a shame. That. We're talking about nuclear proliferation. We're talking about Syria We're talking about humanitarian aid. We're talking about all these different things. And we get questions on the witch hunt. And I don't think the people and actually and I don't the, think the people in the country, in the country, the, and I don't think the people and I don't think the people in the country buy it. country but buy it. the reporters like to but give it a shot. The reporters like to give it a shot. Meeting. Meeting. Very long and meeting. And it was a good meeting. We discussed so many different things. We discussed so many different nuclear, things. Including, including nuclear, uh, including war and peace, uh, including, war and peace uh, including economic, including, uh, economic uh, Syria. Uh, Ukraine, Syria, and at Ukraine, the end of this and at the end of this meeting, this meeting, meeting I think came we to a lot of really good conclusions. Came to a lot of good conclusions. Josh, he is our president. Josh, he is our nation, president, not left as a nation, right. not yet left our right. president is taking yet criticism from both sides. Yeah, well, um, yeah, well, yeah, I think well, he made a mistake. Um, yesterday, I think he made a mistake. And let me be very clear, and let me be very clear about, about, what, very I clear was a about I, what I think nobody was a mistake. Is I, nobody is criticizing his view that we should have an open discussion with Vladimir Putin and Russia. I think that's constructive. I think that's constructive. Of, that of piece the meeting, of, of, of the meeting, 
Where he made a big mistake is he continues to conflate the issue of Russian collusion with Russian meddling in our election. And on the world stage, you're not afforded the luxury as President of the United States and on the world stage, you're not afforded the luxury as President of the United States at dividing what our American intelligence community and the intelligence community and the FBI as a whole in front of foreign adversaries. In front of foreign adversaries. That's not a luxury that the President of the United States has. That's not a luxury that the President of the United States has. I think, furthermore, by continuing I think to by continuing give his to critics fodder, give his critics to suggest that somehow to suggest that somehow he's hiding something, somehow on, Russia, he's hiding something does on Russia to undermine does his more presidency in the end of this Mueller investigation, and the end of this Mueller investigation, almost Mueller investigation anything else that he can do. Anything else so that I think he can that do. was a mistake. So I think that was a mistake. Again, I think Rand Paul and others that were Rand Paul and others that were missing the point. It's not about whether we're interacting with Russia. Interacting with Russia. The point is, if you're going to go on a foreign stage, if you're going to go on a foreign stage, you represent the United States of America as a whole, and you don't bring your petty political squabbles with you. Well, not only is it fine that he be having this conversation, well, not only is it fine that he be having this conversation, it is precedent. Kennedy, Khrushchev, right? We know that Barack Obama was talking to the leadership of Iran before that landmark deal was made, which had all sorts of secrecy inside deals. Which had all sorts of secrecy inside deals. And I think here's this one other thing that's worth noting here. I think some of the critics of Chuck Schumer, I think some of the critics of Chuck Schumer, they basically wanted him to get in a wrestling match with Putin at the summit. You remember just a few years ago, when President Obama was confronted President, President Obama President was confronting China, President Xi after the Chinese China hacking after the, the Chinese office of hacking management of the budget, office of taking all kinds of American secrets. Uh, there was no confrontation. Uh, there was no confrontation. There was no face-to-face showdown. What there was was sort of a back channel. What there was was sort of a back channel. It may very well have been taking place. It may well have been taking place. It may very well have been taking During the conversation that President Trump had with Vladimir Putin. The problem was how it was showcased afterwards. And it was also Obama that back in 2016 said that public shaming of Russia and Putin is not going to be effective in regard this isn't Russian about public meddling. shaming, though. It, it, it's not. But, and I also think that the reason President Trump is conflating the two issues is also because Democrats and the media have done so to try to undermine his legitimacy. But the problem is, when you're, as you, what Josh mentioned, when you're on the world stage next to Putin uh, in Russia, a country that the Pentagon labeled back in, uh, I think, January as one of our nation's biggest threats, uh, that is not the time for ambiguity. And that is the time to be very clear in what you said. And the problem, if you go back and you look at the transcript, President Trump is all over the place. And that's the time to be very definitive. Uh, and I think all, he, he didn't even have to talk Can about I the presidential... Can I ask you a question, though, before, sure. before you hit that next gear? Do you think that we treated this President Putin like the adversary that you just described, or did we treat him like an ally yesterday? Well, I think President Trump, just like presidents before him, Obama as well, uh, is trying to reset relations with President Putin. The problem is, I think you look at someone like Putin, and if he senses any sort of weakness, he's going to take well, advantage of that. he's a KGB officer. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so I, yeah. I think with President Trump, that was a perfect time. He didn't even have to talk about the presidential election. Look ahead at the midterm elections and say, you know what? So. Putin knows that he's not going to mess with the midterm elections. Boom, done, move on. And instead, he leaves all this room for ambiguity. He's all over the place, so people can misconstrue it however they want, or, or even take it for you know what it, it looks I like. I wanted to right. see tall and instead, guy he's intimidation. Clean up this whole mess. I wanted to see our president show some tall guy intimidation over that little squat five foot six <laughs> on a good day, Vladimir Putin, rather Who than has a tossing around, economy. Uh, rather than tossing around a soccer ball. The Wall Street Journal editorial page writes today: the charitable explanation for this kowtow to the Kremlin is that Mr. Trump can't get past his fury that critics claim his elections were tainted by Russian interference, which you guys touched on. But then they go on to, uh, to say he can't seem to figure out that the more he indulges his ego in this fashion, the more he seems to indulge Mr. Putin and the more ammunition he gives to his opponents. And I point at Trish, who came out hard on this when she heard, heard this press conference yesterday, that we cover business. Mm -hmm. And President Trump is a businessman. He is the CEO of the United States of America. But it's not a private company. He doesn't own it. It's not Trump, Amer you know, Trumperica. Mm -hmm. it, we're the shareholders. The American people are the shareholders in this public company. He's the CEO for all of us, not himself. Yeah, he needed to defend us. I mean, think of it like this. You know, if, if you're having some squabbles in your family, uh, you may be having those squabbles. But if there's someone that is an enemy of your family and is taking you on publicly, you know, you, you kind of need those family members at a time like that. And, and he, he missed it yesterday. I mean, it was an easy question. He should have known it was coming. It was a layup. All he had to say was, you know what? We're not going to allow that to happen again. That's all in the past. We are resetting. 
for the future. It was easy. He could have made this a home run. I thought he would have. I'm disappointed. He was not the patriot he should have been yesterday wow, strong on stage. Words. A couple yeah. things that are happening today that we know of, and, and one of them has to do with where other Republicans are sitting. How will they deal with this? Some inside the party are saying, some senators on the GOP side of the aisle are saying, maybe they'll do a resolution really making it clear how uh, lawmakers on Capitol Hill see the meddling that definitely happened by Russia in our election and separate that out. You know, they could help and give the president some, some help in this and separate that out from whatever collusion look is going on. I don't know if they'd go that far in a resolution, but that's being talked about that they would take a, a movement on today. The other thing is that the president is meeting with some lawmakers in the Roosevelt Room to talk about these very issues. Lisa, I want to give you the last word on what you think that meeting should be like. Well, it's going to be interesting. I, I mean, yeah, he's probably going to get an earful about yesterday because what happened... But how do we go forward? Well, in, in all honesty, the news cycle is so busy these days that I think next week we'll be talking about something else personally. But Republicans are going to be frustrated because anytime someone says something in the Republican Party, every Republican has to answer for it. This is what the media does. They don't do it to the left, but they do do it to the right. And so now all these members on Capitol Hill, like Josh's old boss, are going to be very frustrated mm. because they have to answer to this. They have to deal with this. And what's so frustrating is if you mm. actually look right. at the actions of this administration, he's been tough on Russia. So yesterday, yeah. the policies, well, yeah. no, the policies. Yeah. So, so here's it what didn't they, have to be this difficult. And so we got so to move. We got to move on. Here's what they're going to do: pivot back to the economy, talk about another round of tax cuts, tax reform. Number one and number two, more sanctions on Russia. Those are coming. Even Ian Bremmer said that. He said harder line than the Obama policy. administration. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Meantime. Russian President Vladimir Putin sitting down with our very own Chris Wallace last night following that landmark summit with President Trump. The exclusive interview getting heated at many moments as Wallace challenged Putin on tough topics, including Russian meddling in our elections. Take a look. I have here the indictment that was presented on Friday from the special counsel Robert Mueller that says the 12 members of Russian military intelligence, the GRU, and they talk specifically about units 26, 165, and 74, 455. They say, you smile, let me finish. <laughs> they say that these units were specifically involved in hacking into Democratic Party computers, stealing information, and spreading it to the world to try to disrupt the American election. May I give this to you to look at, sir? Here. I really wish for your American listeners to listen to what I say. First of all, Russia, as a state, has never interfered with the internal affairs of the United States, let alone its elections. Incredible. Wallace then pressed Putin on why many of his critics wind up dead. Watch this. Why is it that so many people who were political enemies of Vladimir Putin are attacked? Well, first of all, all of us have plenty of political rivals. I'm pretty sure President Trump has plenty of political rivals. But they don't end up dead. Well, not always. Well, haven't presidents been killed in the United States? Josh, your reaction? Mm. I mean, for, first off, can we just acknowledge for a second what a national treasure Chris Wallace is? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. what an incredible interview. I, I, you know, I, I think when you think about the journalists who do this best, they always elicit some kind of emotion or nonverbal communication from the subject that sort of confirms what they were trying to get at. You, you know, Vladimir Putin's going to sit there and lie to you all day long. Well, you could tell based on the failure to pick up the papers based on his curt reaction to his political enemies discussion that that stuff went right to the middle of what he's trying to hide from the american people and probably his own people just a hats off uh inner I, I mean i can't say enough good things about that it made putin look weak and chris looked strong but by extension i don't think that i'm harris going overboard with this it made the united states look strong because i think that vladimir putin needs to be reminded your economy is smaller than the economy of Texas. And that was part of it. It was calling him out on his lies. Yeah, it was the brand of questioning by Chris Wallace, right? Fearless. I mean, he, he, yeah, he just, he just leaned way in. Something that we know that he does <laughs> at every venture, right? right? That's why we watch him. You know, I, I would say this for Putin. 
oddly enough, a missed opportunity. I mean, there he was. He's just finished with the president. He knows our president, the United States, is getting some criticism at this point. And he makes error after error with Chris Wallace. It was interesting to watch. It was revealing in many counts. And maybe speaks to the issue of what the president is thinking in terms of negotiating now. He is also a master negotiator, right, Trish? Yeah. Um. So <laughs> next moves again, have to I be careful. That, that next moves have to be careful. Were said uh, behind the scenes. I yeah, we don't will know. once again say this was a missed opportunity. That said, thank you, Chris. I mean, thank you, Chris, because I think Americans needed needed some answers yesterday. They needed to see Putin uh, himself on full display, and I, I, I think heels. we got that. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, look. I mean, what was he trying to suggest? It sounded to me, both hmm. in the press conference and in that interview, when he started talking about the assassination of, of JFK or Martin Luther <laughs> King, that he, in fact, was trying to to sow the seeds of doubt in Americans about our own system of government, about our very own democracy. And, and I heard that uh, at times during the press conference as well. So, uh, you know, this is this is not a good guy. And well, they were he's threatening not a good words, guy. too. I mean, those are threatening. Those are very revealingly Did threatening words, He's trying too. to reinforce moral equivalency, That's which exactly he got right. a little bit of that in the press conference. And I think that there was pushback because, again, Americans know that is just hogwash. Well, I thought it was, well, one, we know Chris Wallace is awesome at his job. He was the only presidential moderator who wasn't, who's universally praised um, all around in his performance and the way that he handled the debate. So we all know that he is phenomenal at his job. I thought what was interesting is Putin seemed to kind of defend the hack and the release of the emails because he was basically saying, well, they were true. Uh, and then he was also yeah. saying, well, our Democrats were, you know, meddling in their own yeah. process, right? Oh. So it seemed like it was almost kind of like, you know, it's sort of a justification for um, yeah. the meddling and release. So he almost kind of seemed to admit it a little bit well, he got in the sense of, well, he was well, like, well, they're, they're real. That's what Chris Wallace said to him back. He said, so are you saying it's OK because the facts that they took from the DMC for DNC from John Podesta, it was their real email. So it's OK it's to hard, hack and hard. spread the information. It's, it's hard to believe, Josh, that they're that into our politics, too. I mean, that's way down in there. Well, he is. I mean, this is a KGB guy. Right. And I, and I think actually what's so fascinating about this is for somebody who studies the American politic as closely as Vladimir Putin did, he missed an awful lot when he agreed to do an interview with Chris. <laughs> that's what I was saying. That, you yes, said it more right. eloquently right. than I did. I mean, that's what I was saying. I mean, I don't think he realized what he was up against. There were no. not going to be opportunities for, for Vlad Vladimir Putin in this interview. No, no, he ran into a buzzsaw. And, and I think what you saw is a bunch of whataboutism and sort of telltale signs of people who don't have any arguments to make, yeah. right? They got hit right in the middle of the forehead with the facts, and they got to figure out how to wriggle free as fast as possible. Wow. He treated him like the anti-American murderous goon that he is. Exactly right. Putin. The 2020 election battle heating up. A new report that President Trump's re-election campaign and two affiliated groups have raised nearly $90 million. Does this step up pressure on Democrats to find a challenger? Plus, new reaction to former FBI lawyer Lisa Page's deposition over anti-Trump bias inside the Justice Department. Some Republicans saying her version of events conflicts with what FBI official Peter Strzok told lawmakers. What that could mean for Robert Mueller's investigation. I do think she's um, trying to give us uh, as much information as she's allowed to do which I think is a distinction and a difference from what we saw with uh, Peter Strauss. Welcome back. Well, Lisa Page, the former FBI lawyer at the center of controversy over anti-Trump bias at the agency, wrapped up her closed door interviews with a joint House panel yesterday. Page is in the hot seat over her anti-Trump text messages those? with the embattled FBI official Peter Strzok. Some GOP lawmakers say that Page was forthcoming and suggest that the investigation may be growing. There are differences in, in their testimony. I mean, in many cases, she admits uh, that the text messages mean exactly what they say as opposed to Agent Strzok, um, who thinks that we've all misinterpreted his own words on any text message that might be negative. We learned uh, uh, a great deal of new information again today, and so it's going to require us to do a whole lot of follow-up. 
But one Democratic congressman says that he doesn't see any evidence that anti-Trump bias impacted the Hillary Clinton email probe or the start of the Trump-Russia investigation. I personally thought that the text messaging was unprofessional. I thought that it really was unbecoming. It should never have been on a government phone. That being said, I don't see any indication that any views expressed in those text messages translated into biased actions. That is really the, the question that we should be asking, and certainly Inspector General Horowitz came to the same conclusion. And Strzok testified earlier this month that he did not let his political opinions influence his work. Uh, Josh, so you've spent time on Capitol Hill. Do you think, is Congress using their oversight abilities and power effectively? Well, I think it's a mixed bag. I think what you're seeing with Lisa Page is actually a, an example of how it should work. I mean, what you do is you compel testimony from people who have uh, information to provide. They come in and provide a candid assessment of what they've seen. It allows you to bring in other witnesses, examine the facts, and lo and behold, at the end of the day, you probably have a conclusion that you can rely on. What we've seen instead of that too often is what we saw with the Strzok hearing, which is a combination of somebody who is extremely evasive intentionally confrontational, coupled with, you know, a House of Representatives on both the Republican and Democratic side of that committee trying to make a circus out of it. And, and that is not, that's the exact opposite of what you want because it's not gonna provide any conclusion. Well, and, and Dagan, Congressman Mark Meadows says that he doesn't know if they're gonna compel Lisa Page to testify openly in public. Is that a mistake? I think the American people not only deserve to hear from her, and she certainly will be handled with f friendlier gloves, softer gloves than the way you had Louis Gohmert lamb lambac like a preacher and lambast Peter Strzok about his, the affair that he was having. I think the American people deserve to hear it all. And to that point, during the Peter Strzok testimony, we found out that Justice Department official Bruce Orr was essentially acting as a courier of information to the FBI from Fusion GPS on the payroll of the Clinton campaign where Bruce Orr's wife worked. And that leads us to President Trump, and he would be criticized for this, can declassify a whole host of documents, mm -hmm. including the FISA application, the original application, also, the 302s, those are the information forms that um, include inter interview information that FBI agents did. There is a lot that could be and should be declassified because ultimately we deserve, if you want to improve the image of the FBI, we really need to know what was happening during the election year. I agree. I think the president should get it all out there. You know, and Harris, sort of the crux of the issue here and the main concern is we obviously know that there was bias um, at the FBI. Look at the text messages. Anyone with half a brain can see that. The crux of the issue and the question is, is it provable that that anti-Trump bias had an impact? I would say yes, but is it provable? How would you prove it? Exactly. That's the point. Yeah. Do you think I mean, Congress I, I don't know, I, but I think it's on Peter Strzok and Lisa Page to prove it. Right. I mean, they were the ones sending the text messages. And when I have talked with lawmakers recently, I, and I'm wondering if that's not among their top two questions. Can you prove that whatever you had planned to keep the president out of the White House uh, wasn't unfolding even after you were out of your positions? Was this wider? Was this a wider conversation that was had? Is it still being had? I mean, I have a lot of questions about protecting not just the trust of the American people in the FBI and DOJ, but the actual part that, that demands that we trust them, the way they do their jobs. How do you prove it? I, I don't know the answer to that. That's something that should be a burden on the people writing the text messages. I would say this real quickly, because I don't want to over talk and I want to hear from Trish. Um, at the, at the end of the day, it would be great for the American people to see whatever they can see. But we aren't the ones who decide what accountability and punishment will look like. That's not left up to us. So they could show us less and do more as far as I'm concerned. Do it. Do whatever it takes to make sure that this doesn't continue to happen, whatever it was, however deep it went, uh, whatever was colored by what they were texting back and forth. They, remember, their, their bosses' names are in some of those texts. Andy, Andrew McCabe, former deputy director. All right, I'm done. Well, oh. <laughs> and Trish, does this have any impact? impact on the Mueller probe? It should. I mean, I, I think we get a lot of questions. We deserve some transparency. What bugs me is that Vladimir Putin is sort of getting what he wanted, right? I mean, this mm. is, look at the state we're in where we're saying, we don't know if we can trust our government. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a real question. We don't know right now if we can trust our government. That we don't know if we right. can trust the FBI. And it, when you think of this full circle here, Vladimir Putin got what he wanted because he has rocked us to our very core. Well, I just wonder about people. 
Well, can Lisa Page prove that Peter Strzok lied in front of Congress? Because again, four out of the five guilty pleas that Mueller has gotten from individuals are related to lying to investigators mm -hmm. or lying to the FBI. So folks go to jail for that all the time. And by the way, that we'll stop it. He didn't remember writing that text message. And it was, I was referring to the American people. Don't spit in my face and tell me it's raining. Because that's exactly <laughs> right. what it felt like. Yeah, no, I, I can't disagree with that. I think, Trish, to, huh. to your point that is a really important one. Before we start engaging in a discussion about revealing our intel methods and sources and having a discussion in the open public about how we garner information as an intel community, before we do that, we ought to really ask the question that you asked is, what is Vladimir Putin trying to accomplish? And in my mind, that doesn't get better than that. All right. Well, we're going to leave the, it there with those uh, sober thoughts. Well, just hours after the president's summit with Vladimir Putin, a Russian national was busted in Washington, accused of trying to infiltrate political groups. The suspects reported attempts to get the president and Putin to meet. And what this says about continued Russian interference, you're going to want to stay tuned. The president will speak atop his meeting with lawmakers in the Roosevelt Room later today. 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, we are getting some details on what will happen there. Uh, there will be a pool opportunity, meaning the media via one representative of the media will be in there to gather what's happening at 2 p.m. Eastern. And uh, we call that just kind of a spray. The president's 2 p.m. meeting with members of Congress will have that atop. He's expected to make remarks on his recent trip to Helsinki, Finland. Let me put this into context for you. Uh, members of, of his own party, Republicans are saying today, senators, that they may consider a resolution to make it very clear that America does in fact see the intelligence as being true on Russia meddling in our last presidential election. So with that, the president will make his remarks about Helsinki, I would imagine there might be um, some interesting comments back and forth. Don't know if we'll be privy to that, though, because the rest of the meeting after his remarks will be private. Members of Congress who are expected to be in attendance, Kevin Brady of Texas, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, representatives Mike Bishop, Diane Black, George Holding, Jim Renacci, uh, Peter Roskam, and Eric Paulson, all there to talk next steps and tax cuts 2.0 is what they're talking about that so dagan to my right had said republicans will probably start to talk about the economy right now because they need to uh with some new things coming down the pike the president today 2 p.m eastern pop your corn your day is made we'll move on <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile the same day as that summit the justice department announced the arrest of a russian woman an fbi agent alleging that maria butina a self-described Gun enthusiasts try to infiltrate U.S. organizations like the NRA and push Moscow's agenda while on U.S. soil. And that she sought to set up back-channel communications between the Kremlin and U.S. politicians. This from the affidavits which were filed. Quote, these lines could be used by the Russian Federation to penetrate the U.S. national decision-making apparatus to advance the agenda of the Russian Federation, end quote. The case, not part of the special counsel Robert Mueller's probe, as far as we know, the charges filed by Justice Department national security prosecutors. So this is kind of a, a sideline story now that's hooked into uh, the narrative of Russia, whatever that tends to be at whatever hour. Josh? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know that we needed more proof that Russia has a really robust, very significant espionage operation underway in the United States and has for decades. I mean, you know, this is not the first, this is not the first in the last few years. This is, I mean, this is ongoing, right? And, and this is clearly a threat that we face at all levels of government. And it's not just the Russians, right? It's the Chinese and others that have been trying to do the same thing. So anytime we can root somebody out and you can press charges, that's a good thing. But I don't think anybody should have any mistake about what kind of intentions the Russians have with respect to the American government. All right, so you've got these organizations inside the United States like the NRA. What do you say? Well, I think that if this is a Russian individual. She was, according to the affidavit used to arrest her, she was being um, led or directed by a Russian official who was identified in the press as Alexander Torshin. He's the deputy central bank governor. He was sanctioned in April. So what does this administration do? Because we've been 
hard on President Trump and his performance yesterday. But what this administration has been doing is keeping sanctions in place, adding a, adding additional sanctions. There are a, a more than three dozen Russian individuals, including cronies of Vladimir Putin that sanctions have been on, also much larger multinational corporations. But there's a lot of pressure that we're still putting on Russia well, from from well, funding should, arms and, of the Ukraine. And we should charge and deport her. But let's, let's also not present the existence of spies as something new. I mean, go back to 2010, the FBI's Operation Ghost Stories where they found 10 Russian spies and expelled. Anna Chapman was the name that was most reported. But there's also a woman named Cynthia Murphy who posed herself as an accountant trying to get into Hillary Clinton's inner circle and Secretary of State. So what we should do in the United States government should do, charge her, deport her, get her out of here and go after anyone else Real that's quickly. a spy in the United States trying to hurt the United States government. Real quickly, Trish, uh, how, how concerned should we be? What kind of push out, pushback do we put on when we, our own organizations are being sought after? This is not political. These aren't politicians they're going after. They're going after U.S. organizations. Sure. Um, I think we have to be somewhat fearful about the world in which we live right now. It's not just the Russians, but the Chinese as well. Do not forget about the Chinese and their efforts to spy on us and to influence us. I mean, we, we need to know who we are. And one of the problems right now is we don't. Right. I mean, you have so much political bickering and it's time that everybody sort of come together and recognize right. that the threat is outside the United States. We need to stick together and make sure that we're on the same page when dealing with well, Russia. If somebody or right. how about if somebody right. sounds like Boris or Natasha, you don't <laughs> talk to them. You don't let them inside your organization. Must kill moose and squirrel. Well, be very wary. <laughs> the thing that we got the bottom line there is pulling together for certain. Yeah. Trish, That's right. Got that. I heard an amen, I thought. From Josh <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Men's all around it. <laughs> House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi possibly losing more support from her fellow Democrats. Can she? <laughs> Hasn't been looking too good. <laughs> she continues to make her case for Speaker of the House should her political party win back the chamber. Whether the defections will bring a fresh face or further divide the Democrats, we'll talk about it. Stay close. More and more of her fellow Democrats are distancing themselves from House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi as she works to secure the votes to become Speaker of the House if Democrats take back the chamber from the Republicans in the upcoming midterm elections. Two Democratic House candidates in California, Gil Cisneros and Katie Hill, declining to commit to voting for her should they win their races, as did 10-term Congressman Joe Crowley of New York when he was asked about it on Sunday. This on top of about 20 other Democratic lawmakers or candidates who have publicly said they would not support her. Lisa Booth, she's still raking in the money, though. Nancy Pelosi has raised nearly 70 million this election cycle, breaking her own previous record. It's why she's still the minority leader. Yeah, and she's still a liability to Democrats. I mean, you look in, I mean, I was part of the 2010 NRCC team, 2010 elections, and we had so many ads that tied candidates to Nancy Pelosi. You look at the Georgia 6 special election, it was used effectively there. Now, Nancy Pelosi, being someone who's been in leadership for a while, she doesn't care. So she's telling Democratic candidates, denounce me if you need, wink, wink, nod, nod, do what you have to do to win. So in the instances where they disavow her, clearly it's difficult to try to use her against those individuals like the Connor Lamb race. That being said, back in uh, 2016, she had more defectors than she had seen in a decade. So maybe this chorus continues to grow and potentially she gets unseated. Josh, you know what the, the, uh, that people are worried about in her own party of this crumbs, pathetic, <laughs> putting the schmooze on her calling $2,000 bonuses given to the American people because of tax reform crumbs and then doubling down and tripling down on it. They're afraid of that being a commercial that somebody cuts yeah, against them in the midterms. Yeah. And it is. She, she's long been a liability for Democrats, but it's not because they don't believe in exactly what she said. They all believe that it's crumbs, right? They all believe in open borders. They all believe in abolish ICE. They all believe in impeaching President Trump and reversing all of the tax cuts. That is uniform in the Democratic Party these days. What's different is that the Democratic Party is undergoing a full-fledged civil war. 
and we saw it play out in Joe Crowley's district. Mm -hmm. You saw it last weekend in California when, they, when the Democratic Party endorsed a left-wing ideologue over basically a Democratic icon in Dianne Feinstein in California. It is playing out in cities and localities all across this country. It's the most underplayed story in politics. We read and heard about for 10 years the Republican Civil War. Well, guess what? The Democrats are having one, and it is far worse than Republicans ever had. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, she's well, making a face. <laughs> well, part of that civil war, though, and, and this is what is very alarming, I think, for our country, is that there's a socialist arm of that Democratic Party that was started via Bernie Sanders, and, and you saw what happened in Crowley's district, et cetera, and that's catching on in a way that is not healthy, frankly, for, for anyone. Um, so we should be cognizant of that, of course. But look, Nancy Pelosi... Her time has kind of come and gone. I mean, the, the Crumbs comment is a great example, but it's one thing after another. And so she's increasingly this San Francisco elitist that it represents really the past. And I think the Democratic Party needs to focus very hard on going back to its roots because you know what? Donald Trump has taken those roots. I mean, you think about those blue collar and how exactly does that work? Where is it successful? Well, it Nancy doesn't Pe work. It what? doesn't work. That's a period. commercial that you're going to see as video of what happened in Venezuela quite mm -hmm. frankly. And by the way, they think Nancy Pelosi and her ilk think that they make better decisions with your <laughs> money th than you do with your own money. That's the, that's the end of it. 2020 seems like a long way off, but the president's re-election team is not wasting any time. It has raised a boatload of money already. A whole lot. And the president says he doesn't think any Democratic candidate can beat him. We debate it next. More and more of her fellow Democrats are distancing themselves from House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi as she works to secure the votes to become Speaker of the House if Democrats take back the chamber from the Republicans in the upcoming midterm elections. Two Democratic House candidates in California, Gil Cisneros and Katie Hill, declining to commit to voting for her should they win their races, as did 10-term Congressman Joe Crowley of New York when he was asked about it on Sunday. This on top of about 20 other Democratic lawmakers or candidates who have publicly said they would not support her. Lisa Booth, she's still raking in the money though. Nancy Pelosi has raised nearly 70 million this election cycle, breaking her own previous record. It's why she's still the minority leader. Yeah, and she's still a liability to Democrats. I mean, you look in, I mean, I was part of the 2010 NRCC team, 2010 elections, and we had so many ads that tied candidates to Nancy Pelosi. You look at the Georgia 6 special election, it was used effectively there. Now, Nancy Pelosi, being someone who's been in leadership for a while, she doesn't care. So she's telling Democrat candidates, denounce me if you need, wink, wink, nod, nod, do what you have to do to win. So in the instances where they disavow her, clearly it's difficult to try to use her against those individuals like the Connor Lamb race. That being said, back in uh, 2016, she had more defectors than she had seen in a decade. So maybe this course continues to grow and potentially she gets unseated. Josh, you know what the, the, uh, that people are worried about in her own party of this crumbs, pathetic, <laughs> putting mm -hmm. the schmooze on her calling $2,000 bonuses given to the American people because of tax reform crumbs and then doubling down and tripling down on it. They're afraid of that being a commercial that somebody cuts yeah, against them in the midterms. Well, and yeah. it is. She, she's long been a liability for Democrats, but it's not because they don't believe in exactly what she said. They all believe that it's crumbs, right? They all believe in open borders. They all believe in abolish ICE. They all believe in impeaching President Trump and reversing all of the tax cuts. That is uniform in the Democratic Party these days. What's different is that the Democratic Party is undergoing a full-fledged civil war. And we saw it play out in Joe Crowley's district. Mm -hmm. You saw it last weekend in California when, they, when the Democratic Party endorsed a left-wing ideologue over basically a democratic icon in Dianne Feinstein in California. It is playing out in cities and localities all across this country. It's the most underplayed story in politics. We read and heard about for 10 years the Republican Civil War. Well, guess what? The Democrats are having one, and it is far worse than Republicans ever had. Mm-hmm.
trash yeah, you well, make in a face. <laughs> well, part of that civil war, though, and, and this is what is very alarming, I think, for our country, is that there's a socialist arm of that Democratic Party that was started via Bernie Sanders and, and you saw what happened in Crowley's district, et cetera, and that's catching on in a way that is not healthy, frankly, for, for anyone. Um, so we should be cognizant of that, of course. But look, Nancy Pelosi, her time has kind of come and gone. I mean, the, the Crumbs comment is a great example, but it's one thing after another. And so she's increasingly this San Francisco elitist that it represents really the past. And I think the Democratic Party needs to focus very hard on going back to its roots because you know what? Donald Trump has taken those roots. I mean, you think about those blue collar and how exactly does that work? Where is it successful? Well, it Nancy doesn't Pe work. It what? doesn't work. That's a period. commercial that you're going to see is video of what happened in Venezuela, quite mm -hmm. frankly. And by the way, they think Nancy Pelosi and her ilk think that they make better decisions with your money <laughs> th than you do with your own money. That's the, that's the end of it. 2020 seems like a long way off, but the president's re-election team is not wasting any time. It has raised a boatload of money already. A whole lot. And the president says he doesn't think any Democratic candidate can beat him. We debate it next.